it at the end of the day. I have muted everybody now. Um, I am admitting people from the waiting room in and it's absolutely, well, for June and Roger, they don't have a choice. Cameras have to be on, but for everybody else that's attending, by all means, you guys can shut off your cameras or keep them on as you wish. I leave that completely up to you. Uh, but in order to not have any background noise, I have muted everybody. We are gonna be going live in one minute. So do get yourselves prepared. Um, and, uh, and then I will start recording today's session. And just for everyone's reference, there is the chat box. Obviously, we are going to be using that throughout the presentation. Um, so if you want to have that already up and open, please do. For those of you that are already in, I am going to copy and paste all of the contact details from Jin, Roger, and myself. So for those of you that are in, you'll see that for the first time now. Um, I realized after yesterday's session that you only see items in the chat box once you've logged into the system. Um, so I will keep copying and pasting that um, throughout the presentation so people have it. If you already have any questions or comments for Roger that you put in your registration report, then insert them in as well. So we're gonna get cracking. It is half past and I will start clicking on the record button. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Woodburn Accountants and Advisors webinar series. You have joined us for day three, part three of this webinar series, all about setting up a company in China. I am extremely excited by today's presentation because when I speak to Roger about what we were gonna talk about this week and what he could bring in, I loved it when he said, what about talking about the JV infection? And I thought that was fantastic because that is obviously something I try to prevent my clients from going that route because there are, well, I don't wanna to be too negative, but let's just face it. There are more divorces in China than there are perfect marriages. So Roger and Jin are on here today to talk about the JV infection and how to avoid it and what alternatives there are that exist if you're looking the route of um, partnering with people in China. But before we begin today's session, again, this is something more for Jin and Roger, as I've been on here now for three days, to get an understanding about the background of the people who are attending live today. It would be great if in the chat section, you could start interacting with us and let us know a little bit about who you are. I've categorized people into three categories. One are newbies to China, one are startups to China, and one are experienced China hands. To define what that is, for me, a newbie is somebody who has found an opportunity in China, but they are not sure whether a company makes sense for them. They are not sure what alternatives exist for doing business in China, and so they're evaluating that this week. Startups in China are those of you that have been transacting with China for a period of one to three years, and you are evaluating key trigger points to assess whether it makes sense to incorporate a company in China. And for those of you that are joining today, I assume that part of that making sense is whether it makes sense to have a joint venture partner or not. And experienced China hands are those of you that um, maybe you already have an entity in China and you're looking to perhaps go the JV route, you're looking to restructure out of a JV, you may be looking at what to do with the new foreign investment law, not new, but it's just a phrase, I keep saying that it's new, the foreign investment law um, and how to update yourselves on that. So nobody has typed yet. I'm not gonna move to the next slide until the first person starts typing because I do want you guys to interact. The best parts about these webinar series are the Q and A's, and I am expecting people to, to communicate a little bit. Uh, Jessica, very kind of you to be the first one. We are a bit of everything. I love that. Um, uh, that's fantastic. So you're a newbie startup and experienced. Chris is a newbie, fantastic. Clive is experienced. So it's a really big range out there. Beata is a startup, um, fantastic. Guys, this is very helpful. It just means ultimately 
Roger, Jen, a bit of pressure on you. It's a very wide variety of people on here today. Um, but I think you've made your presentation a little bit like that as well. Um, so let's go ahead and just a little bit of admin. First of all, um, technical point of view, we are using Zoom meetings. And uh, you have the ability, I have muted everybody, but you have the ability to put your camera on or off as you wish. We are recording today's session and the recording link will be provided to everybody who has attended or not attended uh, at the end of um, uh, today, hopefully, um, as long as I can upload it onto the YouTube channel. If you have technical difficulties, my only suggestion would be to log off of Zoom and log back in with the link you already have. Likewise, if Jun or Roger run into difficulties or even myself, the three of us are co-hosts. So for sure, it won't happen to the three of us all at once. But if something happens to one of us, the rest will continue. Okay, so be assured the presentation will go on. Um, again, we are uh, clear that we will log off, log back into the system to continue the presentation. Um, for me, there is no dumb question when we are talking about China, and particularly when we're talking about joint ventures, because that is already such a tricky and complex relationship in China when you are looking at joint ventures. This will be 90 minutes of your time spent. Jun and Roger have promised that they will have about a 60 minute presentation, so we will have 30 minutes available for Q&A. Ask away. There is no dumb question. Every question will be answered. Every comment will be answered. We are there for you today and we will stay on until every question has been answered. So please ask away. However, um, I will be copying and pasting regularly and I'll do that now again, all the contact details of Roger, Jun and myself in the chat box. So you have that there now for everyone who is on. I will post it again at the end of the presentation. Um, and you can reach out to us. If you don't want to ask questions because it's a private matter that should be discussed one-to-one, -one, set up appointments with us and we'd be happy to discuss it with you. All right. So a little bit about myself, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Christina kohler Kaluccia. I'm the head of business advisory at Woodburn Accountants and Advisors. Uh, I moved over to Shanghai at the end of 2003, um, started my career off in 2000, January 2004. And I have been in the Chinese market for the last 17 years um, in the corporate compliance sector. So everything in relation of how to open, maintain, and operate a company in China is what my expertise is on. All right. Um, and I've helped over 500 companies with their um, pre-investment advisory. Um, because one thing that I truly like to highlight is that in many instances, you might not even need an entity in China. Uh, so let's find a solution around that if you don't. And even if you do need an entity, we then help you with that pre-investment advisory. We help to implement and we then help with all of the administrative and corporate compliance functions that come after that. I'm also a creator of the China Roadmap Methodology and the China Profit Accelerator, which are workshops that I host on a rotating basis every month. Um, they're complimentary. Um, we've got the China Roadmap Methodology in April, April 6th. If you're interested in signing up, go to woodburnglobal.com slash events, and then you can, you can register there. Um, I am gonna stop talking now and start with today's presentation. So I'm gonna turn over to Roger and Jun. I'm gonna stop my share and they will bring up their screen. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Christina. Dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us uh, today. And also from our side, a very warm welcome to our webinar about the JV infection and how to avoid it. Uh, it is uh, a great pleasure for me and my partner, Chun Cheng, to be guest speakers in Woodburn's uh, webinar series. And we would like to thank uh, Christina for giving us the opportunity to be here with you uh, today. A couple of words uh, about our firm. My name is Roger Bischoff. I'm the co-founder and uh, managing partner of Burnt International Restructuring, uh, which is a cross-border boutique firm specialized on investments in China and Singapore. Um, I have been practicing uh, in China for more than 10 years. I'm also active as a board member of the Swiss Chinese Chamber of Commerce. 
Um, at BERT, we provide comprehensive legal services during the whole life cycle of a company. We mainly specialize in business setups and restructurings, but we also assist clients in contract drafting or commercial law. Me and my colleagues at BERT have acquired a tremendous experience with situations when something goes south. Uh, for example, if a joint, a joint venture needs to be closed or liquidated because of disputes between the JV partners, um, so we, we generally know what can go wrong. At the same time, this is usually also the very reason why people uh, reach out to us or foreign companies or investors who come to us before they even consider getting into a JV relationship uh, with a Chinese partner. To be mindful of a, a couple of things can be invaluable, especially when dealing with, uh, with China. It can save the, the foreign investor from costly mistakes. I guess as a, as a Switzerland and China-based firm, uh, we are allowed to say that our two countries have very strong ties when it comes to joint ventures, um, or we can also call it a pioneering role. Uh, Switzerland was not only one of the first Western uh, countries who formally recognized China, but uh, Schindler, the elevator company, which you may be familiar with, also entered into the first Sino foreign industrial uh, joint venture in 1980. Credit Suisse um, then later entered into the first uh, Sino foreign uh, securities joint venture, and UBS, the other big bank at the later stage, even got the first majority stake in such a, a securities joint venture. So, this as a background, um, ladies and gentlemen, under the current a challenging economic environment, many companies are actually reviewing their overall China portfolio and also the long-term competitiveness and, and consider potential investments or divestment options. Who knows, you may also be uh, looking to set up a joint venture in China or you already have uh, an existing entity and you, you plan to close it down. The goal of today's uh, event is to shed some light on the legal as well as the cultural factors which are of paramount uh, importance for the, for the rare success of, uh, of a China uh, venture as uh, Christina already mentioned. The way we plan to approach this is as follows. Uh, I will first provide a quick introduction into the topic and share uh, some insights with respect to the cultural uh, factors based on an actual case we have uh, recently worked on. My colleague Jun will then uh, focus more on the legal challenges and will also co uh, consider conceivable alternatives to a joint venture. As a quick background, uh, I understand that Christina uh, yesterday already held an interesting webinar about uh, China's new foreign investment law with our colleagues uh, Valentino and Diana. Uh, hence, I don't want to go into details here, but in order to understand the opportunities and challenges for establishing a joint venture in, in the era of the Chinese inve foreign investment law, I would like to recapitulate uh, that the foreign investment law has created a unified law for foreign investments in China. That means it has replaced um, as well as not only the WUFI law, but also the law on Sino foreign equity joint ventures, the HJV as well as the law on the Sino foreign cooperative joint ventures, the CIV. So all these laws have been basically uh, repealed and, and are combined now in, in one uh, unified law. Besides that, uh, all foreign invested companies are now governed by the Chinese company law, as well as the partnership enterprise law. So in that regard, there will be no difference between uh, Chinese companies and, and foreign invested companies. One uh, key point of the new law is the extended uh, scope of the foreign investment, which includes joint ventures in the category of greenfield investments. But of course, a joint venture could also be created when a foreign party acquires a stake in, uh, in an existing entity which was previously held by Chinese only. Um, if you want to where the title of today's presentation comes from, uh, Christina already briefly mentioned it. It's, it's just a fact and the various studies also uh, 
have proven that that many joint ventures run into issues sooner or later. So I want to address why is this the case? Um, if we look a bit closer at the problematic side of things, there are basically two reasons why a joint venture can fail. Uh, first, there's the venture part. And then second, there's the joint part. All ventures are risky uh, because they involve change, they involve the unknown. Hence, this venture risk is normal. In fact, failure is inherent in the idea of a venture. However, ladies and gentlemen, the, the real problems usually arise in the joint part. And for example, on this slide, you can see the most frequent uh, disputes between the joint venture partners. Um, these are disputes uh, about the equity transfer, about the shareholder qualification, then the shareholder's right to know, um, disputes about uh, capital contribution, uh, corporate dissolution or liquidations, and then uh, corporate interest. The question now is how do parties usually end up in, in such disputes? The trigger uh, is very often that some, someone lied or breached the contract, which of course uh, triggers um, the respective um, consequences according to the agreements. Or someone also can maybe try to lie or try to hide something from a JV partner or was in otherwise dishonest uh, in the daily operation of the joint venture. What we often see also is, is that the interests of the joint venture partners are actually not fully aligned. I would like to illustrate this uh, based on the actual case, uh, which is a typical example. Uh, we recently had a case of a Dutch industrial uh, company that entered into an equity joint venture um, to produce hydraulic units and wind turbines for, and, and solar systems. The Chinese partner had 60% ownership and the Dutch party 40%. The Chinese party also controlled most management positions. For example, they had two members on the board, the, China, the Dutch only one, and they had no one in China. The, the Chinese had very close ties with a state-owned enterprise and also the local government. We, we actually didn't advise on this initial setup uh, instead, the client came to us later when the relationship with the JV partner uh, turned very bad already. After, after multiple uh, negotiations, the parties uh, finally agreed to, to liquidate the joint venture. And uh, when we got the case, we first found out that um, the client wasn't even actually operating in a restricted area. So a joint venture would not even have been necessary uh, in particular, not one with, uh, with a Chinese majority stake. They could have set up uh, a, a Wufi, which, which is a wholly uh, foreign owned enterprise. Um, also the Dutch party provided technology uh, as a capital contribution, but uh, since it was only know-how, this was not really sufficient. And uh, during the liquidation process, the, the Chinese party actually questioned this cont contribution because under Chinese law, usually only registered IP can be contributed. In fact, if we, if we look back at the, the reasons why this relationship broke down, um, there are actually multiple reasons. First of all, there was a clear lack of communication and understanding between the parties. Um, the Dutch didn't speak Chinese. The, the Chinese uh, party didn't really speak English because it was not in Shanghai or somewhere close. It was a bit in a, uh, yeah, in a, a remote area of China. Um, the way that it was set up, they used an agent. All documents were prepared in Chinese, so the Dutch didn't even know what they signed. This is also very common. Uh, there was no English translation. Uh, some of the, the positions that they ended up with, they had no clue why this was the case, so it was at least not what they intended. But not only things went wrong on the initial setup, but there was also a clear lack of um, control on the side of the Dutch. Uh, the Chinese on the other side, they were more interested in the technology to produce their own products rather than to promote the business together with the, with the Dutch counterpart. And, and the Chinese also showed disregard in this specific case, disregard for the rules 
They had several books, for example, and no formal documentation of board decisions. They basically run, run their own show. Often uh, a dispute is rooted in, in diverging interests and expectations from the start, as I have mentioned. A short list of what both partners uh, usually are looking for is presented uh, here on this slide. We have the foreign investors on the one hand. Of course, they want to get access into the Chinese market. They want to overcome some trade barriers, understand the local trends and tastes, also the legal environment. Um, ba basically, they want to make a safe investment. Then on the, on the other hand, we have the Chinese uh, entity. They um, usually attempt to adopt an advanced technology or improve their R&D capability. They look for expansion. They, they want to add new finance sources or increase the firm's reputation. There is actually an old Chinese saying that um, applies to any sort of partnership uh, without meeting the minds. Uh, this is called same bed and different dreams in Chinese, Tong Chuan Imen. Um, the Chinese use this proverb to often describe a bad marriage. But of course, it could also be used for an unfruitful uh, union or a joint venture. So the question now is, how can, we, how can you avoid a bad joint venture marriage? Well, I would say by putting your dreams to the test before you actually wed. Foreign companies, uh, what we realize, very often rush into a joint venture uh, relationship without ever uh, discussing their respective dreams with their Chinese uh, counterpart. So there's not really a wonder why also the interests are very often not clearly aligned. If we take a broader view, we can basically uh, categorize the risks related to a joint venture uh, in three categories. The first are the internal risks, which mainly concern the relationship um, between the parties and um, the conduct of the daily operations. Uh, some of the issues here I've already mentioned. Uh, the second group are project specific risks, which are risks related to the venture itself. For example, a construction company, they might run into delays or they might not get some approvals from the government. And then on the, uh, the third category it are usually external risks, such as, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic, which are, of course, much more difficult to prevent and, and, and also to control. Our experience shows that um, in most cases, the internal risks materialize uh, in practice and lead to the, to the end of a joint venture or to, to serious um, disagreements and, and disputes. Now, Please let me uh, take a look at the obstacles that are generally uh, encountered by the foreign investors. Often uh, we see a lack of understanding of China's um, social or business environment by the headquarters uh, abroad. This can be in the US, in Europe or in Australia. I want to explain that on the basis of some concepts that basically tell us how the Chinese society is run. So we have Qing, it's the emotional connection between people. Usually if two people already uh, know each other, then Li is the correct way to behave between people. For example, morals between uh, strangers and Fa is the, is the law. As, and as you can see from the first bracket, law is the least important. So it doesn't mean that the law is non-existent in China but it is definitely considered to be of less importance than, than the morals, for example. The, the idea behind here is that moral people don't need the law to act in a moral way, and people that need the law to tell them how to act morally are actually immoral. So I give you an example. Let's say uh, you do business with a Chinese company and there is a dispute regarding something in the JV contract. There are three ways how you can respond to that. First, you can argue um, the contract says this, this, and this, so you must follow or you must abide by that. Uh, you can say this to the Chinese counterparty. This is generally perceived as a far attitude, and it is the first thing which a Western company would think of, but it is not very well received in China. A stronger Li argument would be like, 
this is not right. This is not the way we discussed it, things, and, and this is not reasonable. Or a, a Qing argument would be, how could you do this to us after all we have been uh, through together? Then uh, the second concept uh, is Guangxi, which you may have heard before, especially the participants who are familiar with China. Um, but Guangxi is actually one of the most discussed uh, topics, but least understood also among foreign companies in China. Guangxi uh, not means relationships or connections, but there are several aspects to it. Many might say, okay, I went drinking with a business partner, so we built Guangxi. What, but this is, this is false. Uh, you may have bounded a little bit, uh, but it doesn't mean that you have a relationship with the business partner that is stronger than someone he knows, for example, from, from college. Guangxi is also relative. You can have more Guangxi uh, with other people, and there's also a negative form of, of Guangxi. Uh, there's usually a basis of real familiarity um, to build Guangxi between people, for example, a long exchange of favors uh, that, that built the relationship or the same school that you went to or the same family. Um, yeah, then as you may know, the third uh, concept, uh, Chinese people have the motivation to ensure that they don't lose face and also to prevent others uh, from losing face. Losing face means that uh, you end up in a situation that's embarrassing to yourself or to others. Practicality, um, practicality means that in China, the simple solution is not necessarily uh, the practical one. Um, the best solution is usually the practical one. And uh, you could have certain regulations, for example, that you don't care or that you can't abide by or you Oh, it's difficult, so you would need to find a way um, around this, basically, and that's a bit how it works sometimes in China. You need to try sometimes a few times, also with regard to registrations. It's sometimes a bit trial and error, and, and that's something uh, overseas firms often struggle with, uh, especially with the laws, uh, which are quite vague, and also the bureaucratic policies and practices. In other words, the, the JVDCs, as we call it, is mainly caused by diverging interests uh, and lack of uh, foreign control. So, so the question here is how can you minimize uh, or the risk or the damage? I would say uh, go solo if possible. Um, there are other ways to create a cooperation, uh, which my colleague Jun will explain uh, shortly or at least use some measures or controls like jobs, for example, to strengthen your control system. Generally, um, a wholly owned entity or a wholly owned subsidiary, um, we, 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 we think is preferable, but um, a number of industries in China still require a joint venture or special licenses. This is something that needs to be checked uh, in each uh, case, and we can definitely help you uh, with this screening. Um, generally, don't think of China as a EU restriction where you can manage your investment through remote control from the headquarters overseas. Um, that also involves don't blindly trust the local employees or the, or the partner. Keep a close eye on the business in China. Uh, if there is a lack of time, then please, uh, I will recommend outsourcing the services to professionals like Woodburn, for example, that are familiar with the local market and the practice. Uh, I'm not here to scare you uh, about China by telling you uh, horror stories. Um, the problem with PRC joint ventures is not China specific. Um, it, it is uh, JV specific. Um, it seems that JV simply are not... Uh, tend to be not a, a, a rather bad way uh, to conduct uh, business. Um, let's face it, China is a big market. There are tremendous opportunities, but you need to uh, closely watch your business and uh, we are available to advise you along the way. Since we have dealt with uh, lots of contentious situations, we know how to structure the deals and the cooperation agreements uh, in a way that uh, the chances of uh, things going wrong can be minimized. As the critical uh, success factors, um, I would mention the following. Um, definitely choosing the right partner is definitely crucial. 
Then um, the second point is what we call a mutual, mutual friendly leverage. Um, yeah, the aligned interests and also understanding the each the, the other party's incentives, why they want to uh, enter into a JV relationship uh, with you. On this slide, you will find a summary of the uh, some relevant partner selection uh, criteria. A again, I'd like to stress the importance of the alignment of interests. Um, here also, it's advisable to get external assistance um, during the screening process. If I may summarize my points, uh, in order to prevent uh, future litigation, uh, a good planning and having a proper deal structure in place is key. Uh, on a related note, it comes without saying that it is important to have well-written uh, agreements. The third point are effective corporate governance mechanisms align and aligned interests. Uh, I can't emphasize this enough, which also includes, for example, incentive plans. Um, last but not least, uh, prepare for the worst and uh, think also about a good exit clause. With all of that uh, said, and without uh, further ado, it is my great pleasure to hand over to my colleague, uh, Jun, who will uh, focus now on the legal challenges. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Christina, for organizing such an interesting uh, seminar. Uh, Jun, your slides are not showing. Yes, I'm, you, I'm. Oh, there we go. There we go. Super. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Christina, thanks to Roger, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to be here to share with you our expertise uh, in this uh, interesting topic. And uh, about myself, I give you a very simple introduction. Uh, I after got my PhD in law at the University of Fribourg. I have been practicing as a lawyer in both uh, uh, China and uh, Switzerland. So my focus is mainly on international commercial law, merger and acquisition. Uh, com uh, competition law and the international arbitration law. And uh, my colleague Roger has introduced to you the possible barriers from this culture uh, perspective. In the following part, I'd like to share with you legal challenges in forming a GV in China. And uh, this petition will end with the possible alternatives. Regarding this the legal challenges, uh, there are many five uh, possible legal risks for you to think about in the in, in a GV uh, aspect. The first is necessity of local partner and control over GV, IP protection, national security, review, and the limitation of foreign exchange. But, but, but before going further, I would like to uh, first uh, give you a very Brief, uh, give you a very general picture about the China's legal environment. Although China, China, China's constitution is in this Article 5 said, provide that the, this country should be governed by law, but in reality, this is still a country that the rule of law is not ruled by law. A rule of law, that means the, con the, the law is only a tool to manage the country, uh, the country is not be respected by the people. So this is the reason is uh, the first is important one is because China is uh, there, there, there are 2000 years long uh, traditional history, uh, uh, traditional history, there's without, is not controlled, is not governed by, uh, by law. And the second reason is because China is a new country and uh, is a uh, very young and uh, the, 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 the system is still developing. So that's the main reason and the, 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 the consequence of this, uh, this uh, factor is the a uh, so a very neutral judicial system has, has not been established and the, the, the judges are not well, well trained 
many of the artists are from the military. They, uh, they served uh, as, as, a, as a soldier in the military. And after, after, after uh, um, they retired, or they could work as a judge in the court. And then there are not so many lawyers in China, corresponding to the, to the population. And to, uh, according to statistics, there are only, there are only uh, four uh, until uh, uh, March 2020, there are 423,000 lawyers in China. A cor cor uh, co co by comparison to Switzerland, is a very, there are very few actually. And uh, the, 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 the next point is the Chinese legislation system is quite complex. It's very hard for the foreigners to understand the hierarchy of Chinese law. What's the law should be supervised over others? This is very complex. And then the, because of the China is a centralized system. So the bureaucratic power is always pre, pre, priority over the individual trees. That means the collective interest is, is over the individual trees. If in a case, the country or the, the authority think that is bad to the collective interest of this country, then they could, the, the, the individual interest could be satisfied. And uh, the, the last point is China is huge. Although the China is a centralized system, but the Chinese constitution allows the local or local regions to have some, uh, some special rules regulating the, according to their, uh, to their uh, uh, specific situation. So for a certain, for a certain rules, deep, different regions might have different regulations. This is, makes the Chinese legal environment is, is a, a more uh, complex than, than, uh, than most uh, Western countries. Now let's go to the first the legal risk is whether there's a necessity of local partner for a joint venture. Actually, as the, uh, with the new uh, law, uh, uh, with the adoption of new uh, foreign investment law, this law provides a negative list. That means, that means for outside of this negative list, all the foreigner, all the foreign investment could make their investment. They could, uh, uh, no matter forms a joint venture or uh, Wufi, as we said before, now this is not, the, the name doesn't exist anymore. And they could also be partnership. So they could choose freely. But within the next list, there are two uh, categories. The first category is foreign investors or foreign investment is totally, is completely uh, prohibited. The second ca category, it's with, within this negative list, there are only certain areas or industry could, could, could form in, uh, in, in the form of a joint venture. And uh, this, uh, I, uh, I made list uh, this, uh, a list for this, uh, for this industry. This list could be, uh, this list is a exhaustive list. So outside of this exhaustive list, you could, uh, invest freely. Therefore, like agriculture, then there's manufacturing, there's nuclear, electric power, the transportation, warehouse and transportation service. And then there's inform information, transmission, software and IT service, and leasing and commercial service, education, human health, financial and security. This is, in this, in, within this uh, industry, you could only in the form of a joint venture. So that's why, if you decide to go enter into Chinese market, the first thing you need to check whether your industry or whether your uh, uh, technology falls, falls into this side. And the second legal risk is control over GV. As my colleague Roger has mentioned, is, 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 is there is many mistakes that made by the foreign investors they, they always think if I have a, a 50 percent shareholders, I can control or effectively control over this GV. That, that's the totally wrong, actually. 
when when you operate or when you run a GD in China, actually the 50% shareholder is not enough. You must have actually control or actually operation of this GV. Why is that? Because uh, normally, according to the Western country, the law in the Western countries, if you share, you, you control the 50% of the shareholder, then you could control the director of the board, others of directors. And then you could, uh, you could make your decision by this board of directors. But in China, this is, this is not, not the case. You must control the legal representative. According to the Chinese company law, there's only one legal representative. So not like in Switzerland, for example, you, 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 you might have two, uh, uh, two persons who have the, uh, uh, joint, uh, who has the uh, joint signature power. You could sign both, both sides need to sign. But in China, the legal representative is the only person who can sign. And the second is you, you need to control the like general manager who is normally appointed by the director of the uh, borders, but usually in practice it's, it's usually is con it's controlled by the Chinese party or by local party, local parties. <clears throat> and then you need to control the chops. The time the chops is uh, also very special in China. You, the signature is usually doesn't, doesn't make sense or it doesn't, uh, doesn't play, uh, doesn't play uh, 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 vital rules, but the top is very important. For the official authority, the top is most important. And also you need to control the counting and personal. So this is the, the you have, you, you must keep in mind in this point. And regarding this control from the legal perspective, because the China, is, uh, in this negative list, the, the Chinese law has already provided that in certain industries, it's not impossible to be controlled by the foreign partners like this transportation civil airport basic te te telecommunication mass survey and education the chinese foreign investment law is made that it must be absolutely controlled by the chinese party so when you make investment in china you need to check whether you could have the possibility to control if not then you need to maybe think of other solution this is the second legal is the, th the third one is the IP protection and other new hall. Regarding this point, uh, I just want to remind you one point is the IP right is su subject to the principle of territory. That means only the law, you your, your IP registered protect your IP. For example, if a, a patent is registered in Switzerland, then the Chinese law Chinese law could not protect this IP in China. You must register in China. So this is the very important one. You need to keep in mind before entering to China, you need to register IP in China. Then the second uh, list for this, uh, for this private abuse is this, the IP could be abused by the, the, the very easier for the Chinese partner to get access to this IP and then could build a parallel factory behind, uh, beside this, uh, the joint venture. And uh, regarding this public abuse, uh, the, main, uh, the main point is uh, the Chinese authority might abuse, abuse this IP, especially these state-owned enterprises because they are established by or set up by the, the, the government. So it's quite easy for them to, to force the, uh, the foreign investors to transfer their, their technology. The fortunately, the new, the new foreign investment law has already a very clear uh, provision saying that the foreign, uh, the Chinese authority is prohibited to force the other party to transfer their technology. But this still leaves the room the both parties could uh, agree on the transfer. So this is the third, and then the fourth legal risk is national security review. This is why it becomes important because, because the US-China tension, the Chinese government began to really review this foreign investment on the basis of national security. And uh, here, because it's a complete, uh, com uh, very complicated topic, 
I only mentioned four points, uh, four points here. The legal framework, this is Article 35, is very, uh, very simple in this Article 35 of for investment law. But uh, in, at the beginning of this year, there was a new measures for the second review of foreign investment was adopted. So it's a, it becomes more and more and more and more important in the future. The first point regarding the national security review is the proactive application. Before, this is a new introduction provision. That means for certain areas, especially for these two categories, industry, the, 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 joint, the joint venture must apply to the application to the authority for national security review on, on their own initiative. These two categories include like investment in military industry or military related industry. For this, for this first category, you must no matter you you you, you uh, no matter how it how it works, you must file your application to the authority for the national security review. The second is there's two elements. The first element is investment in this important uh, products or industry. And you also need to, the second element, element is you also need to control, uh, you have control power over this industry for the joint venture. So if you satisfy these two conditions, then you, you must, you must uh, uh, file your application to the authority on your own initiative. And uh, then the next point is scope of review. How, what's could, what, what kind of uh, re review could be conducted? There are four elements. First is whether the investors is sensitive. The second is whether the target is sensitive. The, the, four, the third is whether the industry is sensitive. And the fourth is the, whether the areas is sensitive. That means the region, whether your, uh, the, the factory you will build is around the military service, for example. This could be a very sensitive, could be uh, conducted by under this new law. And then the contents of review, this, this, this is the third point I would, would like to mention. It's this established the standard of review. When the authority have received your application, what kind of standard I, I could use? There are many six points. It's national defense and security, economic stability. What, that means whether your investment threatened this six point. If your is threatened to this point, they could be rejected by, by the Chinese authority. And the next, uh, uh, the fourth point, also the last point I would mention here is the procedure. The procedure is uh, also a, a complicated one, but I would like to mention first is you have the proactive application, but the Chinese law also encourage, has a system that encourage the authority or other competitors to file application. That means if you don't want to do uh, uh, file su su such application to the authority, then the other authority could do that or other competitors could do that. So it's, it means you, if you, you don't want to do that, you are forced to do that. So this is uh, the, 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 the design, design of these systems. And the second uh, procedure is decision, decision maker. Who could make decision? The MOVCOM, that means the, the, the Chinese, uh, the, the, the Ministry of Commerce, they, they are not decision maker. They are only receive your application, but the decision maker is made by the joint meeting, a joint meeting which composed of uh, re relevant ministers from the uh, attached to the state council. They made the final decision. And uh, after they receive their application, then they all conduct a general review. If after general review, uh, they think the general venture is no problem, then you could continue. If, the, if, if the, uh, there's a problem, maybe threaten the national security, and then you, they, they will go to the special review. The consequence could be re uh, rejected or, uh, or accept. So this is the procedure. And the, the last the legal risk is could be the foreign exchange limitation. This is also the uh, new provision in this uh, uh, new foreign investment law, this article 21. It's mentioned that you, uh, for, this, uh, for these seven categories, you could uh, freely, for the foreign investors, they could freely remain into all of China. So this is, 
uh, this is a non exhaustive list, uh, but uh, really uh, how, uh, how to decide it depends on, on case by cases. Also in the, uh, depends on the authority decision. So I think this is also legal risk. And now let's, uh, let's, let's end with these alternatives. So whether, uh, apart from the joint venture, whether there's other possibilities we can choose for the foreign investors, we can choose to uh, invest in China. Actually, there are, there are several op options. The first uh, uh, option is could be the uh, wholly owned subsidiary. Uh, the, that was before is uh, called Wufei. And for this, both the uh, Wufei or GV, they, are, they have advantage and disadvantage, of course. And uh, for example, the, 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 the Wufei, you could uh, make a decision uh, faster and you could uh, protect your IP from individual uh, violation. And then you, of course, you have the 100 percent ownership. That's a very good advantage. But for the GV, you could also have an uh, advantage. For example, you could uh, share or distribute, uh, distribute the, uh, share the risk with other partner. And also the lo local partner, they have the better, not usually have better condition, or they have the uh, good uh, distribution uh, uh, terminal. This could be used by the foreign investors. So uh, each of us have an advantage and disadvantage. So uh, it depends on, uh, in which stage you are in, and uh, 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 what's your purpose? What's what's your what's the for, what's the purpose of this foreign investment? So this uh, we can we can help you to identify what, which which is better. And also there are other options. This is the license agreement. You could not you could uh, you may not want to establish a WUFI or joint venture, but you could establish a contractual relationship directly. Well, uh, for example, licensing agreement and then franchising agreement or distributing agreement, for example. So this could also be, uh, be a, a, a good option. For us, our recommendation is here. For the startup or for the very beginner to uh, enter into Chinese market, maybe just establish a contractual relationship is a, is a good start. And you can then, you, after with this, you can know a little bit the Chinese market and you can know how Chinese partner works and uh, uh, whether you uh, have established a mutual friendship like my uh, colleague Roger has mentioned. And after that, you, you think you are familiar with this market and then you could have a GV or you could have a Wufei. Yeah, this is, uh, I think that's, uh, that's all uh, our application, uh, presentation. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You are mute. You are mute, Christina. Yeah. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Awesome. Um, so Thank you guys so much for the presentation. I have written down nine questions just from my end that I would love to get answered um, based on, on what you were discussing today. And there were definitely questions that popped in as well. But from the audience today, what did you learn? Um, this I always raise this question in my webinars because it's a tool that I wanna understand from people whether they actually got something out of the presentation, whether they actually have questions. Um, please type in what you learned. What was your biggest takeaway from this? Hopefully it's not fear about going into the Chinese market, but uh, just a little bit of security. And hopefully the questions I'm gonna ask will bring, that, uh, will bring that around a little bit, but do let us know what was your biggest takeaway. All right, so I am going to, before I'm selfish and ask all the questions I have, I will answer a couple of questions here. So the first one came from Beata. And this was in relation, Roger, to the slide you had up about the amount of disputes there are in China. Um, I don't know for what period that was for, but Beata was saying, do you have any numbers for the period 2006 to 2020? Basically, I think she's asking, do you see more disputes arising in China with joint ventures? Do you see it improving? What, what do you see from a statistical point of view? Beata, I hope that's the question you actually wanted, because that was something I had actually written down as well. 
Um, but if you could give some feedback on whether you see joint ventures getting worse, more successful, what type of disputes are being raised? All right, uh, I don't have more recent data right now, but I can definitely confirm that it has not become better, um, especially uh, when we look at the situation. I mean, it's also a bit COVID related, but even in most recent years, there have been a lot of um, uh, disputes and also a lot of liquidations. Um, so I would be very surprised if the, if the more recent data would show a different picture. So let me just let me just touch on that, Roger. From your experience, what you know, on average, how many liquidations do you process in a year? Per year? Yeah. On, on I mean, in the number of years you've worked with the Chinese market, what what does it look like in terms of liquidations? I mean, also just for foreign investors, right? Because it, it kind of might give people an I idea of. You know, it's not all peachy in China. You know, there are cases where China is not the right market or, or the strategy wasn't right. On average, what are you seeing in terms of liquidations? Um, well, that's why I say that's a good point. I mean, that's why I said generally uh, companies are right now and we see that trend. It has definitely went up a lot in the last, I would say, two years where we see much more liquidations than previously. Um, for several reasons, of course, there was also um, the, the tensions, as June mentioned, between the US and China. So a lot of American companies actually um, exited the Chinese market. Um, on the other hand, uh, that on the other hand, we see more European companies, also you Australian companies that enter into new uh, joint venture relationships because the Chinese are also looking for alternatives um, to, to the to the US actually. So it's a bit, it depends a bit on which region of the world we are talking about, but um, generally I would say there was a clear upward trend um, in, in the past two years with, with respect to closures, uh, liquidations, um, et cetera. All right. Um, Jessica, just quickly your question. Yes, this is being recorded and a link will be provided. Um, Jessica also had a follow-up question um, I don't know on what slide you were looking at just for, related to your question, but she was asking um, if they have, if you have a 51% shareholdership control, is that enough to warrant safety in, in your organization? Yeah. Um, may, may I ask, may I add something to this? This is, this is actually a very good question uh, from Jessica. Thank you very much for that. Um, I would like to address this because um, Many China joint ventures fail because the foreign partner made the fundamental mistake of believing that 51% or even more ownership of the joint venture gave it an, an effective control over the joint venture. So, so the, the, the short answer is no, uh, even 51% is not sufficient. And let me elaborate a bit on that. Um, foreign investors too often assume that Chinese joint venture companies are managed according to the, to the common Western corporate model under which a board of directors has controlling power over the company. Um, since the board is elected by a majority vote of the company owners, most foreign investors strive to obtain 51% ownership interest in their China uh, joint venture. Um, and as the majority owner, the foreign investor just assumes it has the right to elect the entire board and thus effectively uh, has control uh, over the joint venture. Um, the, the, pro the issue here is after winning the struggle uh, for the percentage ownership, the foreign investor will frequently uh, give the Chinese side the, out the authority to appoint the joint ventures representative director and, and the company uh, general manager. That's what uh, Chun very well um, highlighted. That, but this concession actually seeds seeds the effective power and effectively renders the, the foreign investors struggle for board control meaningless um, because the Chinese side will intentionally ang angle to ensure that uh, this outcome and, and often by, by even offering to concede on the majority ownership uh, uh, to the foreign investor in return for the control over these two key management positions in the joint venture. So, the bottom line here is uh, to uh, cut a uh, long story short, if you want to effectively control, have control over your joint venture, then you must avoid this mistake. Uh, so if you do not, 
uh, you will not have actual control uh, over the day-to-day -day management of the company. Um, and that's that's often then the, the true issue here. So think, again, yeah, let me let me ref yeah. let me also put in my two cents on that, Roger, just sure, you know, one thing is having percentage percentage ship over a company. And the other is who's running the company, who's operating the company, who's making decisions on a day to day basis, who's operating that bank account, who's going to be repatriating funds to you. Who's going to be making decisions on a day-to-day -day business that can impact the strategy that you have set forward, right? Um, and if you don't mind, I'm just going to add a case study here because I, I did make a note of this. Um, I actually uh, was brought into a joint venture in Shanghai, um, and uh, it was between, long story short, Ultimate Shareholders, a European company, but they used a Hong Kong company as the shareholdership into this joint venture. Now, I just wanna highlight that when I got involved, this was maybe 18 months into this collaboration and this company already being set up. And the first thing that I noted after reading the joint venture contract was that the foreign party stipulated in the contract that they were going to appoint a finance manager. And I thought, brilliant. I have someone who is on the side of the Westerner who I can communicate with. You know what they did wrong? In those 18 months, they never implemented that. So you spend hours around a boardroom table negotiating things that are in your favor and then you don't even execute. You don't even execute. So why did we come in? Um, we came in to do a health check on the company to find out that actually the accounting team in the joint venture was the accounting team of the Chinese party's own company and the transactions that were being messed up or mixed up between both companies. So we would see one day in the books a 500,000 renminbi uh, outgoing payment returned the next day because the accountants made a simple mistake of making the bank account details wrong. All right, how does that look in the relationship? And in the end, the only person I could I mean, we, we were able to fix things up, but ultimately the way of fixing all of this up was that they should have appointed from day one a finance person that was responsible purely for the JV and not having an accounting team responsible for two companies and mixing them all up, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's always going to be on the operational side. Focus less on, you know, dividends and you got to make this company work for first before you can think about profitability. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Profitability is the last thing you should be thinking about. Make the operation work and function. Um, so, I mean, I'm saying it from, again, the accounting side, which I, I do on a day to day basis versus the actual structuring and, and, and the joint venture contract and the negotiations. But I see too often so much time spent on the joint venture contract. And then, you know, a complete break taken from the day to day operations. It's such and it's such a pity. Um, yeah. I don't know if you guys want to add something on that. Yeah, I, actually, I can give you a, an additional clarification from a legal perspective. Actually, according to the Chinese law, this legal representative is why it's important because it represents the companies. If the foreign investors couldn't control this, this position, if the legal representative assigns something or side contract, this is totally under the name of the companies. So the company will, will uh, be responsible for this contract. So this is why this position is, is important. Also, uh, like, uh, like, like uh, you guys had mentioned, that's the financial accounting. If you don't know how, how it was done, it could be like, you know, uh, to the and a par parallel uh, companies. So this is a very risk. We have dealt with uh, uh, several cases uh, regarding this uh, breakup of this GV because of this reason. Yeah. And, uh, the and then people say it's to save costs. Yeah. We'll use the accounting team of the Chinese company because then we don't have to hire our own accounting team. And we save money, guys. We save money. That's true. That's true. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, look, I, we're, I'm not trying to blame. I'm not trying. I am maybe a little bit trying to pick on you guys just a little bit in terms of making mistakes. But these are the mistakes that are made that are so fundamental yeah, this is not yeah. China specific. This is this is a, like like Roger said. This is a joint venture specific. 
not only China. Uh, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, just following on that point, Jun, about the legal rep, Rachel had a question, which is, does the CEO have to be a Chinese national? I think well, it would be a lot easier if you could explain what the corporate management looks like in a joint venture. Um, because I think people are, are maybe misunderstanding what CEO is, board of directors, chairman, legal rep. Can, can you maybe explain a little bit what yes, the corporate yes. management looks like? Sure. Actually, uh, because this new foreign investment law and the GV, this, 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 structure, this structure doesn't exist anymore. So everything, John Mentor, Wu Fei, this all uh, managed according to the Chinese uh, company law. And according to this Chinese company law, it doesn't ne necessary whether the CEO or whether legal representative is uh, Chinese or not. This is, uh, is, uh, is not necessary anymore. But it's, this is different from the uh, pre uh, previous uh, uh, regulation. So this is uh, it's not a problem anymore. Uh, um, John has, has a bit of a, a lengthy thing that I want to just read out. He was sick because he's got a couple of questions in there. Um, John said, very informative. Thanks. Is there a measure of how many generally fail? 60%, less, more? Uh, no, there's an, you, you couldn't see a very specific number for, for this. Why? Because the journal venture, like any other legal structure, could be filled in any way. And uh, of course, you also, uh, for the like, no, no, no matter for the local partner or the Chinese partner or, or, or the foreign partner, they could benefit, like if the German last already 20 years or 30 years, both of them already benefit a, a lot. So there, there must be some, some wrong maybe, and you could continue or you could broke up. This is everything. This is not only for the domain, for every corporation, this could happen. So I couldn't give you a very specific feature on this, on this uh, 60 or uh, 40 or 40. No, this is not possible. Yeah. That was a very diplomatic answer, Jun. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is also the, the, the true answer. Huh? This is also the- I agree, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I mm. mean, I mean, John, just to mention, there are a lot of um, foreign owned companies in China that are also very unsuccessful. Yeah, right? that's true. Um, but then they stay in the market because they feel from an image perspective, they have to stay in the market. So they somehow survive to keep that entity running. They downsize it, they do whatever they have to do, but just for an image perspective, they maintain it. So. You know, there are also a lot of foreign, just generally foreign investors that don't do so well. Um, just to continue with John's uh, next question is, it definitely demonstrates to me the importance of cultural awareness and effective communication. I've seen this firsthand from experience over the past 12 months. Any lessons learned from the companies that have done these things well? Can you guys provide some tips of where you've seen a bit of success in the relationship and the communication and the profitability of a, of a JV and what they've done well um, in that regard. Um, as I mentioned, um, what is really crucial, I would say, is that at the beginning, before you sign any contract, that you analyze the situation, that you uh, watch closely what are the legitimate interests of both parties, that you make sure there is an so uh, as well as an organizational but also a strategic fit like in terms of product but also organizational wise in terms of the management of the company then of course the the, the skills and the knowledge and the resources should be uh, complementary um, because that's in in a way that the, the bottom line of, of a joint venture that's the whole uh, point or the whole idea behind it so that if you gain market access that you can not only uh, provide synergies or have synergies, but also share the, the costs and risks. So as you, as you rightly point out, John, I would say um, having a very uh, close communication from the get-go, from the start, uh, and, and have a proper analysis and, and set up also of the whole joint venture, including the contract. Of course, as, as Christina mentioned already, long-term success. And, and of course, there's never a guarantee. I mean, if we compare the, the rate that uh, was asked, 60%, uh, if we compare it, for example, with the divorce rate in the West, which is over 50% nowadays, uh, it's probably comparable. Uh, so it depends a bit also you know, on the 
on the time horizon, um, you can have a current rental which works for a couple of years and then later down the road, you, you get into issues and, and struggles or, or disputes. So there's no one uh, size fits all answer to that, but uh, I think, um, yeah, the, 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 the points have been mentioned. That maybe, is important. maybe I can just add in a couple of tips from an operational perspective of how you can um, check that your joint venture is healthy. So first of all, again, it comes down to resources, but if you are negotiating in a joint venture contract that, um, I don't know, you're gonna put in a, a, a legal rep or you're gonna appoint a, a GM to the organization, it's your responsibility and ship someone over and do that and invest in that. If you are going to appoint a finance manager, execute that. Go through the recruitment process and find a finance manager or start off with the outsourcing solution to a provider of your choice, right? Um, the, second, the second thing I want to mention is, so whatever's in your JV contract that you fought so hard for, make sure you execute that and you, you follow through on that execution. I think the other thing is just from a corporate governance perspective, um, Drin highlighted uh, this in his presentation is, you know, basic things. Who's going to operate the bank account? Who's going to have access to it? Rachel's asking a question about how to exit and how does a foreign investor get their money out? Well, the first thing is you got to go to the bank to make sure you can remit it. Who's going to do that? Is it going to be the Chinese party? Is it you? Is it the finance manager you appointed? who's going to do that actual job, right? Think about the nitty gritty details that have to happen. If you, um, uh, I'm just thinking about corporate governance. So, you know, one is the bank account. Then the other is just, uh, nobody mentioned yet about having a supervisor. So, and I don't wanna put you guys on the spot, but I'm just saying we offer the solution of acting as a super, or I offer it personally, of acting as a supervisor in my clients' companies, whether they are joint ventures or not. As a criteria around that, I have to do the accounts or a health check on the accounts because otherwise I'm not fulfilling my role. Um, I have been asked to be a director of companies and I refuse to hold that role. But Roger, Jin, what would you say about having ind independent parties appointed yeah. in the roles of directors or supervisors what what is your feedback on that that's actually from the this is a really a culture difference between the you know the chinese culture and the uh, uh, and the western culture like in china according to this company law there is you could have a supervisor but uh, from the perspective of a chinese pa partner do you really think uh this is not important because it's just a formal uh, position you know and this is a very, very important. You, you never, you, you don't think it's, it's, you think it's important, but for the Chinese partner, they don't think it's important. Because I, I'm the legal representative, then I can't do any, I, I can't do anything. This is a really a, a, a culture difference. So uh, this is a, a one, one point I would like to uh, mention. The second point I would like to mention because, because of this uh, culture difference, because we, we have experience uh, uh, to help both the Chinese part, uh, party and, uh, uh, and the foreign party, foreign partner. Uh, for the Chinese partner, they usually they don't want, they, they never, all, they are very rare to, uh, before signing contract, they very rare to uh, consultant to the lawyers. They don't think, they, why, why is that? Because they think that the contract is not important. How could be implemented. This is important. This is the, the point Roger has mentioned is the pro, pro, uh, practicity. They just you know do that and they think okay the contract is is there but we can you know we can implement it in different way. But for the foreign partner, partner they always want to ah uh, before signing contract I need to uh, uh, I need to uh, consult with a lawyer or uh, with a, a consultant. So this is the really uh, cultural difference. So this is a, when it come to the uh, uh, operation. That's why the operation is important in this in this case. Operation is always uh, uh, more important than the than the contract or than the right. or than the in the formal uh, uh, formal uh, uh, documents. So right. this is the, the point. So I'm gonna say something on the operation side. Um, 
I've been going through interview processes right now with accountants and um, generally accountants in China, they start off their careers in CPA, uh, local CPA firms um, doing auditing functions. And um, the first question I always ask these Chinese accountants is, what was your experience auditing Chinese companies versus now working in foreign invested companies? And they say, there is no system. When we ask for documents, there are no documents. When we ask for filings of you know, monthly accounts, there is nothing. Basically, the audit is a way for the Chinese company to start doing their management reports and all of this. This is the consensus on the market. And it is well known that foreign invested companies, because like you said, Jen, they're going to consultants, they're getting the advisory, they have the foundation and the basics of having um, the finance system set up, the accounts set up, et cetera. And they have the management reports on a monthly basis and all of this. Um, when you're doing a joint venture, you're gonna have the Chinese style of how to do accounting or system processes or operational guidelines or you know, how to do discounts within the organization, which is so erratic, there is no system. And then you're gonna have the Westerners who would like to develop that. And there's a conflict there because the Chinese don't know how to do it. They've never done it. And the Westerners, they don't know what should, they should be doing in the Chinese market. But this is again, something for a foundation for a company, you have to have operational guidelines and system processes in place. Otherwise it can't function, there's chaos. And when you have two decision makers, maybe even sometimes more investors, how can you make decisions if the basic foundation is not there, right? So, you know, um, place a lot of focus on developing, and, and you will have to be the ones proactive on that, developing, you know, um, operational guidelines, system processes, when you are selling, what are the discount limits? Um, how are you gonna do invoicing? Um, and that all leads then to the financial, you know, system. Are you gonna have an ERP system or not? Or just simply an accounting system? Um, John was just saying, um, how important is it to have a compliance officer role in the company? This is very you know, good, yeah, good question. Uh, uh, Can I answer this question? Or? Yeah, go ahead, go <laughs> yeah. ahead, John. Absolutely. Because this is a very, very important and very good question. Why? Why is that? As I said before, uh, like the, the Chinese partner, they, they don't care about the contract, but this is uh, on, the, on the condition that you are already, uh, they have the, uh, the the joint venture works very well. The both part they work work together very well, and uh, you don't need you you, you can do uh, anything you want. But once you once the things put out good south, then you still need something to regulate this rule. And especially if you are in a, in a court, if you you are you have been uh, you have violated the regulation, then the the problem would the problem would would be the uh, there would be a lot of trouble from the legal perspective. So I, I said the Chinese, the Chinese partner did not, they very rare uh, refer to the consultant legal uh, or lawyers. That, that I mean, I, I, I think this, this is good. This is not good actually. So I still for the uh, requirement for the foreign investors, you must have a, a attorney to control or have a, a compliance officer to control whether the regulation is in compliance with the Chinese uh, regulation. If not, after the things go south, after something uh, in, in trouble, then you will be in trouble. That's, you, you should listen to your, uh, in this point, I still recommend you should, you should respect the regulations. Yeah. So this is a, this is a very, a very important. And just note, I mean, you know, everyone is very adamant about um, budgets and financial controlling. So even if you don't hire a compliance officer internally, it doesn't mean you can't um, initiate compliance activities that through outsource providers, you know, getting legal health checks, getting financial health checks, yeah. having risk companies come in to look at the organization of your documents and your transactions. Um, you know, you don't have to do it every month, but every quarter, biannually, every so often, just to know that your company is in a good standing is critical. Well, the way um, we do it sometimes, Christina, that you have a, a first uh, initial check on the contract that you receive, for example, from your clients, then you can already filter them a bit and lead them in the right direction. And then sometimes you would reach out to us 
and uh, if there's follow-ups or to do something to change or to do that, that's also a more cost-effective way of handling rather than employing right. a full-time uh, professional Person. as a compliance officer. Right. Um, Rachel had a question about how to exit and how does a foreign investor get their money out? Do one of you want to touch on this or should I, should I start? Sure. Go ahead. Um, okay. So um, just, just one point, Rachel. So one thing that I'm going to, I'm going to tease a little bit, Jin left out in the alternative section was actually a case that Roger and I worked on, um, which was um, actually an Australian company looking to do a joint venture with a Chinese investor. And funnily enough, when the joint venture contract was lying there, which was I think 50 pages long, the Chinese investor was like, there's no way I'm reading this. Is there not an easier way that I can invest in your company? I do not want to read this joint venture contract. I don't understand it and I don't want to hire a lawyer. So actually in the end, in order for the Chinese investor to invest, they just had a very simple loan agreement in place. So they went from establishing a joint venture concept to owning this production facility 100% from the overseas company and the Chinese investor just having a loan agreement, acting as the GM and putting it in. So I did want to add loan agreement as an alternative as well um, and the idea of avoiding a joint venture structure. In terms of getting money out, again, it depends on who's operating that bank account. And it also depends on how you've negotiated your joint venture contract. The easiest is through dividends, but that means you've been profitable. The other is through licensing agreements, which Jun highlighted. So if the company in China is utilizing your trademark, your patent, your copyright, whatever it might be, license it. That's a repatriation out. Royalties. Ma Yes. Royalties, royalties. Thank you, Roger. Management fees. If you, okay, nobody's traveling to China right now, but you might be spending time on the China business. And why shouldn't you get paid from that joint venture for the time that you're spending on growing, depending on your role, on growing that Chinese business, right? So that's another avenue of getting your money out of the joint venture. But this really needs to be agreed upon in the contract, ultimately. Um, ahead of time. And then one thing is the joint venture contract. Another is then having these licensing agreements and management fee agreements in place so you can actually execute the payment out at the point that you invoice. It's not just because it's in a joint venture contract that it flows. You need the paperwork. You have to have the contracts, the invoices ready, all of that. And that has to be approved by the tax bureaus ahead of time. Go ahead, Very Roger. important point. Yeah, sorry, just to add one cent on this, because the bank, if you do the transfer, they will ask for the documentation. So very often you need to share the agreements then even, and then that's why it's important to have it in place. Yeah, that's yeah. true. If you go to the bank and then if you want to transfer the uh, transfer of, uh, remit, your any profits, into, you must have all the documents in place there. This is very, very important, yeah. Super. Okay. Let me just look at, oh, so another thing that I wanted to um, mention is that, you know, in order to get the compliance in, and again, this is a big mistake that I see from people, you can do all of these health checks and you can have lawyers come in and check that the, the legal standing of the company is all in compliance. If your lawyers or advisors are telling you that there is a red flag, please take action on that. <laughs> you might think, that makes sense. And why wouldn't anybody do that? Trust me, there are people that don't out there. You know, I, I've again done financial health checks where I've highlighted red flags and zero action has taken place. Um, and this just leads then to the pile of mistakes getting bigger and bigger and you're not taking action. So uh, I wanted, I did want to highlight that as a point in terms of, you know, even if you have a compliance officer, listen to that compliance officer if he's finding things and make decisions quickly, take action quickly. Christina, if I may add something to this. Um, yesterday in the webinar, which I joined also, there was a question from, I think, uh, Mr. Evans um, on, on an existing joint venture. And that, that's related to what you just said. 
uh, the question wa was, what does you need? What do you need to do if you have an e existing equity joint venture with respect to the foreign investment law? Um, I just wanted to quickly address this issue also. Um, as it was mentioned, the, the new foreign investment law provides for a five-year transitional period, which started on the 1st of January 2020, actually. And uh, in, within these five years, you must uh, restructure all the existing foreign uh, invested companies and make them abide by the new uh, regulations. So, so what we strongly recommend here to our clients is that they have a look at the shareholder agreement, the joint venture contract, the articles of association, uh, any technology license agreement and, and corporate governance structure to make sure that they are in line and compliant with the new foreign investment law. So that that's and and don't and yeah now that the five years look like it's a long period. Well, but now it's, it's four years. Hold on, it's now well, four now years. Now four years even. It still looks like a long period, but it's actually not the case because what will happen if you if you need to make changes to the to the whole structure, then you will have to re-enter into negotiations also with the Chinese counterparty, and that's going to take time. So that's why we strongly recommend to do that health compliance check uh, early, as soon as possible, uh, because then you can also work on the implementation of the changes. So you run, don't run into the risk that you will be in compliant uh, four years down the road. Um, yeah. I have, I mean, there are no other questions that are popping in, but I do have one final question, which I thought was actually really interesting. And I wanted to see it from a practical standpoint. Jun, you were highlighting about the National Security Review. Um, I found it scary. Yeah. Because um, what, and tell me if my understanding is correct or not. My understanding with the National Security Review is that if you have a joint venture in China, or does it also apply to if you have a company in China or just no, joint ventures? Only for the, uh, this is applied to the, all the foreign investment. It's not only for the so joint venture. Any form of foreign investment. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you, you as a company, you need to submit proactively a report yeah. uh, about whether you abide by the national security law. Yes, exactly. But um, only in certain areas, not, and, not and all only in certain, not, yeah. not, not everywhere, only in certain yeah. areas. Yes. Um, how do you know? if you have to do it? Because you're saying in certain areas, does that mean in places like Shanghai, you have to do it? Yeah, so this is the law. I, I didn't mention it in my petition because of time problem, but uh, the, the Chinese, uh, this new measures has provided a career consulting uh, provision. That means before you want to file application or you would like to file application, you can first uh, consult with, with the uh, authority whether you need to uh, do this do uh, national survey. Yes, this is a uh, prior procedure. This is, I think, is is good for uh, for the foreign investors. Okay. Uh, you know this. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the first thing is you go to your Ministry of Commerce and you say, "Do I have to do this report for yes. the National Security yes. Review?" Okay. Exactly. And yeah. then in practice, so I mean, the first thought that came to my mind when you were going through the flow of decisions and the meetings and all this is, I mean. If they say they don't like your report, do they kick you out of the country? Because you were writing terminate. I didn't read it very carefully, but certain words popped out at me. In practice, you submit the review. It goes into a meeting, committee meeting. Yeah. And they don't Plenty. like it? <laughs> what happens? Yeah, if they don't like it, then you you cannot form a joint venture. This is a, a really legal what, what happens if you are already in a joint venture? You are ready. You, you, you couldn't do that. You couldn't make investment in China. No, 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 but the National Security Review only came out, what was it, two years ago, one year ago? Yeah, this is, uh, this is a new uh, new measures. This is, a, yeah, this is the new foreign investment, but this is- this It's for is, new this, foreign investors, not for existing? No, 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 before it already exists, but okay. before it's not that important. Now, because okay. this is, uh, uh, the tense between the U.S. and the China is, is, is more important and the, the Chinese authority really care about these issues because okay, it, okay. Huawei was, you know. Understood. Was, uh, so, uh, so, so actually the review is done before you make the establishment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. Before, for existing yeah. companies, it's not, uh, for existing companies that are operating in China, 
Ah, no, 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 uh, not necessary. But not necessary. Okay. Yeah, not necessary. But the question is, the authority they could restart this examine examine anytime. So this is the law, you know, uh, really. So a, that's a why that's why you've got to be fixated on compliance and making sure you're doing everything uh, exactly, above board. Exactly, exactly. Understand, understand. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, just to finish off today's presentation, I just wanted to sum 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 it up a little bit. Um, you know, Roger, Jun, and I we're not against people setting up joint ventures. I think the outcome of what we want to say is if you can avoid setting up a joint venture, i.e. because you're in an industry or sector where you don't need a joint venture partner, um, then we would recommend doing it on your own so that you have full 100% control over your, your entity and you are the sole decision maker around it. And then formulate loan agreements with investors if you're looking for local capital or um, distribution agreements or licensing agreements. Um, there's so many different ways that you can collaborate with potential partners in China versus going the JV route. Um, obviously, there are going to be situations where a JV has to be established for what you're trying to accomplish. But ultimately, it needs to be a win-win situation. And you just have to think very clearly about how you are going to to implement compliance procedures from an operational perspective uh, to make sure that, you know, it's not a failure, it's a success, right? Um, and, and always checking in on that. I know that nowadays with COVID, people can't travel to China. So all JV discussions are kind of put on hold in many instances. Um, that doesn't have to stop you from moving forward. Uh, you know, you can have a lot of conversations over Zoom, negotiations over Zoom with multiple parties and whatnot uh, to progress, um, as long as that's what your aim is for, for the Chinese market. I'm just looking through all the questions I've written down, and I hope I've answered everything. Um, I think that's it. I think I'm going to sum it up there, guys, because we're almost, we've hit the, the 12 p.m. mark. Um, just to finish off today's presentation, um, so... Here are how you can work with Woodburn, but just so you know, Roger and Jun are lawyers in China. Um, they help companies to formulate JV contracts. They help to review and draft any form of contracts. I just wanna highlight are critical to keeping safe in the Chinese market. Even though the Chinese culture doesn't really look highly upon contracts, it doesn't mean that you should not right? They are critical and a fundamental basic of operating in China to protect yourselves. Um, I don't do that type of negotiation. I don't draft contracts. I don't do any of that work. I leave that up to the experts to do that. Um, you know, what we do is simply the actual implementation of the entities. Um, and again, I don't know, Roger, Jun, do you guys act as supervisors or independent directors for companies in China? Um, not in not in mainland China. We usually yeah. Not in mainland but, China. Okay. But we have contacts all like your firm does. Yeah. Right, like, right, right. I mean, I I don't act as an independent director. I I only act as a supervisor of a company. And again, I've got criteria uh, based with that. Otherwise, I can't fulfill the appointment. Um, this is a, yeah. The supervisor is quite important. Uh, it's yeah. for the foreign investment. Yeah, investors. Um. So just know, you know, I've got. I've got several lawyer friends of mine that are on my speed dial <laughs> in case something ever happens to me in my company. That's something I would recommend for everyone, right? Um, have a lawyer, if not one, two or three, because you never know if they're going to be available at the time that you call to help you out um, and have them on your speed dial. And I definitely recommend Roger and Jim. Um, they're fantastic in, in terms of being able to guide, guide companies in that direction. Um, for both of you, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a great pleasure. Thank um, you. I'm thank just going to copy and paste our contact details again in the chat. Here you go. Um, in the chat section, you'll have everybody's contact information. You can copy and paste it if you wish to reach out. Um, Patrick, I'm not sure if you're still on here. Uh, I think he has he may have logged off. Um, but there is a message from Patrick 
Roger and Jen that, um, or maybe you haven't seen it, it's been directed to me that I will refer to him in, a, in, a, in an email. Um, so what's next on the list? Yeah, contact information is in the chat box. Um, we've got two more sessions in this webinar series. Tomorrow, I've got Manfred popping in to talk about China market entry and how to get the most out of it within your first three years. And then on Friday, we're gonna be talking a lot about registered office address in China. Because as I've highlighted throughout the last few days, this, this is probably one of the key mistakes that people make on market entry and setting up. Um, so if you haven't subscribed to those, you can go to woodburnglobal.com slash events and register there. Um, Roger, Jun, thank you so much for joining us. I'm gonna go ahead and click on the stop recording. And again, the recording will be provided to everybody uh, later on today. Take Thanks. care and goodbye. Thank you, Krishna. Thank, thank you. you, Roger. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye-bye.